Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this Whole School Send webinar. We will make a start at four o'clock. Hopefully um, we'll have a few more people joining us uh, as we go and as, as I'm introducing everything. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm the Deputy Regional Send Lead for South Central England and North West London. Uh, with us today we also have Marius Frank from Achievement for All uh, and Tom Barley from Skills Builder, uh, who will introduce themselves in a, in a few minutes. Um, uh, if you want to give us a wave for now, Marius, so everyone can see who you are. Lovely. Uh, and Tom, do you want to give a wave? We also have Francesca and Natalie from Whole School Send who are providing the technical support. The theme for today's webinar is connection, community and relationships, social and emotional learning to rebuild after COVID-19. Um, now we're really conscious at the moment that there needs to be a real focus on supporting the emotional well-being of both teachers and pupils and that schools are at different stages of working out how they're going to rebuild their communities as, as schools open. Um, and we want the, the resources that Marius and Tom are going to share with us today, uh, we want these resources to be as helpful and as supportive to teachers and school leaders as possible uh, in their efforts to help uh, their school communities uh, uh, as much as possible. So um, all of the resources that we are that, that are being shared with you today are free, uh, they're really accessible, they're clear and we've tried to make sure they're, they're as straightforward to apply as, as possible. Um, but we also need to be really clear that these are options, uh, they're there to be used judiciously depending on the strengths, the needs, the specific circumstances of, of your school. So, for example, if you have a really strong social and emotional learning program running already, then actually the, the free STAR framework that Max is going to be talking to us about uh, may be useful to enhance what you're already doing. If you just want some, some, if you want some really high quality free resources that teachers can download and use with small groups in bubbles, uh, on, on this theme, then the Skills Builder uh, resources will be of particular interest to you. Uh, and if you're looking for ideas on how you can move from a focus on relationship building and emotional healing towards a more formal curriculum, then the Core Strength Framework um, that might help you to plot that journey. So uh, hopefully there'll be something for everybody uh, and hopefully you will feel that you can apply these resources in some manner to your schools and they'll be helpful uh, to your settings. If you haven't attended one of our, our Zoom webinars before, there are a few different ways that you can communicate with us to, to share with us how, how you're finding it. Um, if you have specific questions for us over the course of the webinar, uh, you can submit them through the Q&A box below. And we've got over 230 sign-ups with us today, so we do expect quite a few questions. Um, we'll try and answer some of them live, but if we don't get to them, we will collect them and ask them as we sent out with the slides. So I can already see one of the questions is whether the PowerPoint will be sent out. Uh, yes, we will be emailing out the slides and, and any of the questions and answers that, that, um, that have been given. There's also the chat function which you can use to introduce yourselves and to network like with other people on the webinar. If you can just ensure that your chat function is set to be all panelists and attendees, just so that everyone can see your comments would be really grateful. Um, we're sharing the presentation uh, with you on the screen today. Uh, as I said, it will be emailed out afterwards. If you feel that it is too small, what we can suggest is you can go to the top of the screen. If you select viewing options, and then change uh, your Zoom ratio to 150%, that should help, help things. We're all having to adapt to changing technological expectations. So anything we can do just to smooth, smooth through that, that process, we will of course try to do. Um, we're also gonna be sending out a survey tomorrow, which, um, which you can use to give feedback on the event itself. Uh, this is relatively new for us, delivering uh, CPD in, in, in a webinar format. I would be really grateful if you could take the time to fill this out so that we can improve our events. Uh, thank you for joining. We've got just over 150 uh, people with us at the moment, um, but we'll, we'll make a start. Um, so uh, Marius, I think you're, you're going first, telling us a little bit about the, the STAR framework. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Um, lovely to have so many of you on the call. Uh, my name is Marius Frank. Um, uh, currently, I'm 
uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, resource managers at Achievement for All. Uh, we're a national charity uh, which, which is absolutely devoted to transforming outcomes for the, the weakest and most vulnerable learners in the education system. Uh, prior to that, I was CEO uh, of Asdan Education. Many of you might have used some of the products there. And before that, I was a head teacher uh, for, for 12 years uh, in a school that served an area of outstanding natural deprivation on the south side of Bristol. Um, but uh, one of those schools which were absolutely dedicated to transforming outcomes for young people and their families. So uh, what I'm going to do is lead you through a, a short introduction, a scene setter, if you will, before I go into the, the STAR framework. And then uh, Tom will take over and explain the skills builder framework which uh, we, we work incredibly closely with Tom and the moment we got had the invite to this we thought this is going to be a marriage made in heaven for you guys and then finish it off with our with our core strength framework. Ne next slide please sir. Francesca. Thank you. So um, we want to recognize the challenge that many of you are facing and uh, so these first slides will not become as a surprise to any of you. Covid lockdown has had a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable and the most disadvantaged in children uh, in, in our communities. What we want to do with this webinar is introduce some practical tools that just might re-energise the learning conversation with parents and carers as well as the children and young people in your care uh, and realise that many of you need to take these learners on a journey, a journey towards a more integrated approach to learning, successful learning, and actually a lifelong journey towards independence. So these tools might be useful not just to uh, address the COVID-19 issues, you might find some of these tools useful well beyond that. Next slide. So some of the learning outcomes are, of course, we're going to explore the impact of lockdown on the most disadvantaged and vulnerable. Explore the possibilities of new curriculum intent, implementation and impact. I've used those words very precisely because, of course, they're in the new Ofsted inspection framework. We'll describe these three frameworks. But above all, the purpose of this webinar is to get you to reflect on tools and strategies that you might already have. Uh, Tom and I don't mind if you don't touch what we're offering you. We simply don't mind that, but we'd love you uh, to reflect on what you're doing. And maybe some of the things we say over the next hour will just trigger something in your mind to think, hmm, we do that, maybe we can do it better. We, all, we do that, but maybe one of the tools I've seen could help us do it better. That's the intent. Thank you, Francesca. Next slide. So what are the issues? And I, I cannot, <laughs> I, I cannot preach to you about this. You are living this reality now, every single one of you. And, and some of the statistics nationally are profound. In April, the DFE figures showed that only 5% of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged children and young people stayed engaged with formal learning dur during lockdown. Now, that figure might be subtly different for your school, might be higher, it might be lower. If you're getting above 50%, you are doing unbelievably. But this is a reality that we're all facing. Uh, many families simply have not engaged in the school offer for, for a variety of reasons. Um, many times they were probably overwhelmed with the reality of coping with COVID-19. Many of the most disadvantaged families are in overcrowded housing. Many of the young, fam uh, young uh, families we, we, we know of uh, simply haven't got access to technology or the uh, internet capabilities to access learning as, as many others are finding no problem now. Uh, connection lost with you guys, the key workers. The key workers have a, a profound impact on building trusting relationships in the school community. That's gone in many cases. Many of the young people who've relied on a daily routine and structure have simply not had one. There's a loss of motivation and purpose. Oh, what's the point? Regression in social skills and formal learning. Now, we often see that during the summer break, 
but this is profoundly different. It's longer and deeper than anything that's gone before. And of course, the young people themselves that are living lives online and maybe those fragile relationships and relationship building skills they might have, have been compromised by cyberbullying. Uh, Matt came up with the phrase when we ran through this, this uh, presentation earlier. He said, nothing is as it was. I think you're all living that experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Bands that used to engage well aren't engaging anymore. Maybe you've had some successes with families that haven't engaged before and are now doing so. You can't take anything for granted. Next slide, please. Just... So the challenge is this. Have we got the courage, the support, the ideas and the tools to reignite learning, re-motivate learners, and re-engage with some of the hardest to reach families? Do we need to do something different for our, our bubble? Our bubble of say 10, 15 learners with special educational needs. How are you going to supply a meaningful learning experience to these young people? And do we need to change the way we work to have a different impact? Thank you, Francesca. And a critical question, will Ofsted mind if we if we did change things now having been a head teacher myself uh, having seven Ofsted inspections in nine years because of the type of school we were and the families that we chose to to serve we know the impact Ofsted sometimes has on the way you think and the way you behave as leaders as classroom professionals but we're sensing a bit more permissiveness uh, from Ofsted in the last uh, launch of the framework and time and time again, we've been getting reports back that if you are considering a curriculum around the children you have, and you can articulate clearly the intent of your framework, how you will implement it, and what impact it's having on the young people, then Ofsted will listen. And so I think the take home message from this is maybe have courage, have courage, Think about the needs of those individuals or small groups of individuals in your school community and be brave in meeting those needs. I'm sure uh, Matt will be leading a conversation on this uh, uh, at the end of the, the, the session because I think this is at the crux of it. Next slide, please. So what would that post-COVID curriculum look like in terms of intent i won't go through them but there they are on the screen and the word re appears in so many different places re-establishing formal learning reintegration identifying acknowledging and acknowledging small steps that kids might take building confidence and resilience there are so many absolutely crystal clear crystal clear uh intent statements you can build around this small group of learners. Thank you for just Okay, so we're going to present to you three possible ideas to stimulate thinking, to use if you wish, or to just think, no, I won't use those, but I'll use something else. We really hope that you uh, get excited by the possibilities of rebuilding a curriculum a rebuilding around that group of vulnerable learners that perhaps are disengaged. The first one we're going to present to you now is something called Progress Stars. Thank you, Francesca. The Progress Star is actually an incredibly simple idea. It's no more, if you like, than something you can print out and use immediately with a group of young people, with individual young people. What is a progress star? Well, it's got five arms, and if you look closely, it's got five levels within each arm. What we're simply suggesting is that if your targets are smart enough, and if your outcomes are precise enough, and if they're small enough to be achievable, then something like the progress star can capture a learning journey 
that can be understood by the child, understood by parents and carers, used by all of your staff, and could chart a progressive journey towards a larger target, towards those overarching outcomes for a child. And this could be used, of course, with a young person on an EHCP, it could be used as part of a graduated response, or it could be used for SEN support. Next slide, please, Francesca. So, the progress star, which you see in the middle of the screen, and its associated record sheet, which is uh, just behind it, they're designed to, to, to articulate and present a clear sense of progression a clear sense of achievement, but in a visual and easy to understand format. Of course, it should be, you know, aligned very closely to the objectives and learning outcomes in any planning you have. And the star in its record sheet is capable, as you can see, of capturing five different and distinct learning outcomes. They could be a mix. They could be a mix of social targets. They could be a mix of academic targets. They could be learning related. And it's up to you to shape those the way you want. Next slide, please, Natalie. Now, here, here is a very, very, very straightforward example of a young child, maybe on, maybe we're talking about a child on the autistic spectrum. Maybe we're talking about a child with an EHCP where the communication needs are absolutely fundamental to that young person's progress. Step one is looking at a person who is talking to you. Step two is looking at a person you are talking to. Step three is keeping eye contact with someone through a conversation. Three communication targets. Could you click again, please, Natalie? And those three targets are, are subsumed, if you like, by those three steps within a wing of the star. Next slide, please, Natalie. How do you engage with the family? How do you engage with the young person and, its, and the teachers around these targets? Well, there's a very simple way. You, you design a code, you agree a code. It could be colours, it could be solid lines and dotted lines. It's up to you. And sometimes it's good to get the young person to articulate how they would like it re recorded. But if we use, say, a dotted line for behaviours that are seen consistently at home, if we use a solid line where the activities are, are where the behaviours are first seen perhaps at school, and, and you might use a different colour where it's happening consistently at home and, and at school, you can gradually chart that progress a uh, young person's making and involve the family, which is utterly critical, I think, and many of you will agree, in getting that closeness and that harmonisation between the family and the child and the school. So you can use a variety of ways, if you like, of indicating where these learning outcomes or these social outcomes are being achieved and how consistently. Next slide, please, Natalie. Uh, uh, Francesca, thank you. So um, here's an outcome. Uh, uh, we, we've used black and white just to make it quite uh, clearer, if you like, than, 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 than colours. Um, as you can see, for outcome two, um, uh, at the about the 230 position all the all the lines are, 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 are surrounded there in a nice solid line and also at the sort of 730 position outcome for solid as a rock we're seeing that consistently at, 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 at school uh, at about the 530 position uh, the outcomes being achieved at a mixture of home and school so of course what we'd like to do is work towards it being seen at home and at school consistently in, in all areas and we're still working towards outcome five and, and, and outcome one thank you for this and of course the great thing is uh, you, what you will receive is the star um framework uh, as a powerpoint yeah, they're very easy to print and very easy to manipulate and to edit 
it's yours to play with. But you'll get it and you can print it out on A4 or A3 formats. You can put a picture of the child in the middle, you know, really personalize it to your own, uh, to your own desires. You can, be give, you can give the style progress report to parents and carers during your, your, your conversations with them. It can be displayed in classrooms. What a brilliant way of celebrating progress in assemblies and in gatherings and uh, across a small group perhaps of learners who are all on the same learning journey. Next slide please Francesca. And um, oh, we were we were quite pleased actually when when the DFE changed from seven uh, seven aspects of the new engagement framework and, and decided on five because it matches perfectly the five uh, the five uh, uh, arms of the star exploration anticipation realization initiation and persistence it fits perfectly uh, and you can articulate your own targets within that next slide please. Uh, but what what if you have some difficulties in in, in, in articulating these small steps what if they just happen to be a freely downloadable uh, bank, if you like, of statements which are easily understood, easily uh, stepped, in other words, from one to another, perhaps even had some resources that parents could use and teachers could use to help achieve that target. And also, critically, help young people with a spiky profile who might need incredible help in certain areas but are really clearly progressing at a faster rate and at different levels in another aspect of their work. How can you differentially support those young person with a spiky profile? Well, I hope that's a lovely entree to you, Tom. Over to you to explain the Skills Builder Expanded Framework. Great, so thank you very much. Uh, and hi to everyone who's joined us today. I'm really excited, uh, as Maris was saying, to share with you not only some of our resources, um, and as we said at the top, these are all freely available, um, but also just to sort of reignite some of those conversations you might have had in the past. Um, I know from my own experience, you know, lots of staff meetings that you go to, you scribble away furiously these great ideas that you've got, go back to your classroom, you remember those books you need to mark, et cetera, et cetera. A few weeks down the line suddenly all that all, all those sort of great ideas have been sort of pushed to the back so it's great just to sort of reignite some of those great ideas of the past perhaps a new resource today um so as we was saying i um um sort of come here today to explain um, you know a little bit about the skills builder partnership um we are a very small team a not-for-profit team um formed of primarily teachers um i myself came uh, from a primary background having taught overseas beforehand um, in a school with high levels of um, 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 high levels of EAL, but also of SEN, um, and so I got to know my Senko extremely well during my time there. Um, when I joined the Skills Builder Partnership, um, the work I now lead on is to ensure that all of our learners, uh, including those with additional needs, are able to access and develop these eight essential skills that you see there, and all of it um, you're geared around our mission that one day everyone will build the essential skills to succeed. Um, the everyone in that mission is very, very important, of course. Um, and as you'll see, as we run through the framework, this is not just sort of solely reserved to, um, um, you know, to young people and to children. Um, it's lifelong learning. Um, and it's also very much thinking about different contexts, different settings. Obviously, today we have, uh, I'm sure, lots of teachers, lots of Senkos, but perhaps even parents in the room as well. So thinking about how we can uh, really think about that skill development in a range of settings. Um, and also the, the word at the end of that mission there to succeed, I think is a really important one. Success looks so, so different for you know, um, um, you know, the young people and the adults that we're working with. Um, and to think about what success looks like and to make it meaningful um, is a real key part of that. Um, as Marius explained as well, there's no sort of right or wrong way to do this. There's no off the shelf way to do this. And as we go through and look at the framework and some of the resources, um, I will give you a couple of sort of examples and ideas of how schools and settings are using some of these resources in the framework but as I say there's no right or wrong way to do that so if we can just move on to the next one please Natalie thank you so we can see here the eight essential skills uh, we put, um, sort of break those down into those four pairs there um, and as we heard at the top from Marius particularly 
you know, the time we're going through right now, the self-management skills, I'm sure are coming to the fore right now. You know, those skills are staying positive, also sort of aiming high for thinking about target setting, thinking about set, um, you know, sort of really setting ourselves targets and goals, um, which don't always, you know, don't always uh, have to be these huge sort of long-term targets that lead to these huge achievements. Um, you know, for many of the young people or the adults that we're working with, perhaps thinking about aiming high targets, it could be around a piece of work they undertake, it could be around how much um, they do sort of across, a, across um, you know, the course of a week. Um, obviously the teamwork and leadership skills as well and collaboration um, have really been sort of put to the test at a time like this and how we think about you know, um, you know, the way that we collaborate with others, the way that we work in teams with others, particularly going back to schools and colleges and, and, these, and these bubbles um, is, is going to be a real sort of challenging time. Um, so again, thinking about ways that we can bring these core skills to the fore and these essential skills to the fore and really sort of highlighting the importance of those, but also how we're applying them in a range of ways and also in a range of settings. Um, so if we just move on to the next one, please, Natalie. Um, we can see that for, so, thank you. Um, we can see, so for each of these skills, we, we have created a framework. Uh, as Marius was saying, you know, thinking about what progress looks like, think about what this skill might look like and breaking that down into smaller, smaller steps. So this um, framework here, you can see here, this is our expanded framework. Um, we work from step zero all the way up to a step 15. Um, but what we have developed in the last sort of two to three years um, in collaboration with specialist schools and colleges and organizations is the expanded framework. So it takes each of those steps and it breaks it down into three smaller stepping stones which makes that progress more tangible, more achievable, more manageable, um, and also allows us to really sort of pinpoint and hone in on areas that we'd like to develop and to focus. Um, the frameworks are all written with neutral language, so it makes no reference to age, it makes no reference to stage of development, and it makes no reference to setting. Um, so it works for anyone and anywhere. And as we say, what the, what the, um, sort of, you know, the framework allows us to do is to think about how we can track changes, um, the big thing I'm really keen to emphasize here is this is not a video game. This is not a case of, you know, you must complete step three before you move on to step four. Um, often when we talk about the framework, we refer to this as a roadmap. It's a great way to, to really pinpoint and to target and to focus in you know, particular um, you know, so areas of the skill that we'd like to focus on or develop. Um, there may be areas that, you know, the young people, the children, the adults that we're working with, um, um, you know, um, you know, really demonstrate as particular strengths or skills. There may be areas that we need to go back and um, sort of continually and constantly go, um, um, you know, sort of go back and revisit. Um, I think that's the key part as well of the framework here. It's how it's used. And of course, the areas that we're focusing on may vary the time of the year, particular activity that they're working on, particular people that they're working with. Um, it could be a case of the, you know, the, the step or the sort of sub-step, the stepping stone of that skill varies from day to day. If we go on to the next one please Natalie. Um, as I say for each of those skills, those eight skills that I mentioned there, the essential skills, we have that expanded framework and what that allows is as well as obviously thinking about you know, ways to set targets and looking for next steps, it also allows us to highlight strengths and it gives those young people, those students, those learners, you know, real, the real opportunity to verbalize the skills, to talk about why, why, they're really, why, why they're really creative and how they've done that and how they've demonstrated that. Um, as I say, in you know, the work that we do with schools and colleges um, across the country and organisations too, we've, we've really built up a great sort of bank of best practice. Um, I'd like to share a couple with you now. So if you think about one of our schools in Kent, uh, just started to use the framework this year called Cleve Meadow. Um, they decided it was, you know, sort of, you've got their students in, they looked at these skills, they looked at the students and they thought before we can work on anything else, teamwork has to be our focus. Teamwork has to be the priority. So whilst we've got these eight skills here, for them, it was all about honing in on one of those skills. Teamwork was then referred to, the framework was used to think about in tutor time, you know, where, where we see our strengths, where students might sort of feel that they excel and, and um, you know, can really sort of demonstrate these skills. The framework, the step posters are then used around the school for students to refer to at different times. So perhaps at break time, after a sports activity, um, before or after lessons, they might just be you know, starting to think about how they've demonstrated that skill or a target they might step, sort of, um, um, you know, sort of set themselves 
um, going into their next stage or their next phase. Um, one of our schools as well, uh, down in Devon, um, uh, it's an all through special school down there called Orchard Manor. They use this, um, in, you know, they sort of use the skills builder framework to give them their targets to replace their life and social skills teaching. Um, so thinking about things like circle time, things like PSHE, um, it's really great to sit down and have those discussions and have those reflections around these skills. Um, what was really key there as well is they talked about some of their students found self-praise or self-reflection self quite challenging. So it was a really nice way for them to talk about how they'd seen others demonstrating these skills and then to pick out the different steps, the different descriptors to see those. Um, but also in mainstream settings, we've got some great examples. Um, school I, I work very closely with in Hillenden called Colin Manor. Um, they use these skills to underpin their interventions um, and also their one-to-one -one and small group work that they do. And they think about the progress. These students who perhaps, you know, sort of uh, find academic achievements uh, and academic sort of subjects quite challenging, um, they sit down and they focus on the skills that they've been developing. And it's a real great way to sort of highlight the strengths that they do have and, the, and to really sort of draw out the progress that they have made as well. Um, if we can go on to the next one, please, Natalie. Um, so what we've done is we've developed something here called the interactive framework. So if you can go to our website at skillsbuilder.org and if we just click the next one please Natalie, you'll see a little sort of run through how the interactive framework goes. You can set your skill at the top there. Um, you, you've, got, you've got at the top there the description of the skill, the definition. You then look through those steps and think about which of those skills you'd like to focus on and develop. The build it tab and breaks that down into those building blocks which align with the expanded framework. We've got some reflection questions there. We've got some short gifts to highlight some of those key areas. And then at the bottom, depending on where you'd like to develop these skills and to focus on these skills, some key sort of activities and tasks. So, so perhaps as educators, perhaps as individuals working on it for themselves, perhaps as parents and carers looking to develop these skills at home. There's some key activities, some ideas, some prompts to think about how these skills might be explicitly developed uh, and focused on in different ways. Um, I've just been joined by my two-year-old daughter, so she's testing my stay in positive skills for me right now. Um, so if we go to the next one, please, Natalie. Uh, excellent. So as I say, as well as the framework, we do have a bank and a range of resources. Um, the Home Learning Hub, you see on the right there, as the name suggests, is a great way for parents and carers and also for young people to sort of think about developing these skills at home. Um, it's a, it's, it's um, sort of set up in a way that it, it can be accessed freely without um, uh, parents or carers creating an account. So there's no need to create an account. They're just, you know, you go onto the sort of website and they're good to run. I'm just going to close that door. Otherwise we'll get a rendition of Arna and Elsa. Um, got some skill stories on there. We've also got some short activities um, and there's also a daily challenge. So each day, there's a um, um, you know, sort of daily challenge that focuses on one of those skills. It may, be around, it, it may be around cooking a meal. It may be around how you've helped out around the house. Um, on the left, we've got the resources hub. This is um, obviously geared more towards your teachers, your SENCOs, your support staff. Um, again, it's free to access. Again, it can be accessed without creating an account. If you do create an account, as you see there, You've got the opportunity to create groups and to baseline your students. So it may be against one of these skills, it may be against all of these skills. Great way to, to, um, to sort of track the progress that they've made, perhaps in one of those intervention groups that we talked about, or perhaps the focus skill that I've been working on. And some resources there as well to, um, you know, to perhaps like to use the skills tokens um, to really sort of reward and demonstrate the success. Skills passports to record the ways that they've demonstrated these skills and the skills posters there as well, which take the sort of those, those smaller parts of that framework, those stepping stones between the steps. So you haven't got that overwhelming document. You've just got the real um, sort of key, key points that you'd like to focus on and to hone in on as well. And if we just go to the last one, please, Natalie. There we are. Thank you very much. And I'll pass back over to you, please, Marius. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Tom. Um, uh, Tom and uh, I have, have, have worked quite closely now for the last two or three years, and um, we, we recognise that uh, one of the most difficult tasks I think uh, teachers have is to articulate to parents uh, and to children some kind of overarching structure that actually um, acknowledges that underneath formal learning are a set of competencies, a set of thinking skills, uh, 
that could help you uh, live and work and learn uh, for the whole of your lives. This, um, we, we kind of touch upon it in various aspects of our work, don't we? Um, at the moment, Carol Dweck's growth mindset uh, approach to resilience, uh, social and otherwise, and grit, um, is quite popular. Small element of it. But what about the, the other, the other skills that can be used and deployed and recognised? I think Tom mentioned the verbalisation of learning, the verbalisation of thinking. Uh, if you are a fan of the likes of Vygotsky, you know where I'm coming from. If you can talk about it, you can think about it. And so a language of learning almost needs to underpin everything you, you, you do. Um, we've recognised this amongst the four and a half thousand schools that we've worked with at Achievement for All over the last decade. And out of that absolutely massive intelligence base of frontline professionals, we have developed something that we are calling core strength. Now, there's lots of thinking frameworks out there. So, so please don't think we're saying this is the only one. It, it is clearly not. There's, there's many others. So you may think of about this conversation as something to uh, evoke something you're doing already. But I'll lead you through the Core Strengths Framework because we've, we've written it for the 21st century. We, we've tried to tease out some of those important social, emotional and wider skills that will underpin successful academic learning in English, in maths and in other subjects. So that, that's where we came from. Uh, another reason was when I was a head teacher, and uh, some of you might be familiar with Guy Claxton's work, um, when I came across a 10 year old saying reciprocity, it just cracked me up. <laughs> it's just one of those things, you know, reciprocity. Well, if you understand it, young man, that's better than me. Um, so this language is meant to be uh, accessible to parents and carers as well as kids and also a third element, which I'll describe. So as achievement for all, we, we describe core strength as the confidence and ability to learn. Confidence and ability. So confidence could be your resilience, your building self-esteem, those elements of it, and the ability to learn, if you like, is, is a language of learning which we're promoting. And it underpins everything. To learn, to develop, and, and participate one day hopefully as an independent soul in society, which is where we want every young person with SEM to be. Next slide, please. We've designed the core framework to link together every learning experience within and beyond the curriculum. We're all used to talking about formal learning opportunities in the classroom. But what about the non-formal learning that might happen outside of the classroom? in clubs, in societies, uh, maybe um, in a cheerleaders group or cubs or brownies. And what about informal learning? Peer-to-peer -peer learning, learning from parents, showing people how apps work, expertise from a wide range of different sources. Core strength enables us to talk about all three types of learning and bind them together. Francesca, please. I mentioned three sides of a triangle uh, around the young person. We're teaching professionals, we're the school part. We want to engage with parents and carers far more uh, explicitly around learning. But what about those clubs and societies? So we've developed core strengths in a common, easy to understand language of learning that can be used and applied in youth service provision as well as homes and schools. This is critical. We've, we've done this now for two summers running with a charity called Street Games, who have been running the Fit and Fed program, where hot meals are prepared and given to the most needy kids in Brent, in Sunderland, I think Leeds, Sheffield, and a number of other places. They've used the core strength framework now to add value to the activities they're doing. Next slide, please. Um, our core strength framework is progressive. It supports the growth and application of thinking and learning skills from early years 
through to post 16 and beyond. The targets of progressive, like Tom's framework, it goes up with the chart. Next slide. And critically, we have a range of resources that enable you to reward small steps in learning and perseverance. That's what a lot of learners have always talked about. They, they want acknowledgement for those small steps in learning. Thank you, thank you, Patricia. So, I'll quickly go through the components. There's seven. Thank you, Natalie. Now, if we talk about this magic ingredient called self-management skills, uh, if you look at every single CBI survey uh, from the year dot, they've talked about wanting young people who have a positive attitude and are capable of self-managing to take responsibility for their own learning and as they get older, their career management. But in those areas, we're just talking about things like, of course, being on time, turning up, being in school, as well as listening to targets that are being set, negotiating them perhaps with their teachers and trying to respond. Another 21st century skill is the skill of managing relationships. Managing relationships, what does that mean? Well, communication skills have gone beyond what used to be the face-to-face -face conversation and perhaps two or three people in the group. Now, even young people with special educational needs are gonna be out there on social media, maybe even uh, in working environments where they have to manage one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many networks, sometimes across time zones now and across countries. That is the complexity that we want young people to grasp and realize. And also within managing relationships, we talk about good leadership and good followership. Thank you, Jessica. And how about managing information and information flow. I, I, I don't believe young people when they say they can multitask listening to, listening to their favourite music whilst on social media and doing their homework and perhaps watching a television programme at the same time, uh, but some can. Fair enough. But, but if you think about it, learning is being redefined because it's not just what you learn, it's unlearning and relearning. Think about every time you get a mobile phone update and you change your equipment. It, it's constant. It's constant. And how about spotting the signal from the noise? How about spotting fake news? There are a whole hatful of skills that young people need in terms of managing information and creating new information. That's what we're the, the, the final one of these four building blocks, which perhaps don't link to formal learning, is cr what we call creativity in context. Now, a, a lot of schools worry about the state of their arts curriculum and justifying it. And, and how does art fit with music and dance and drama? How can we, if you like, justify it in young people's minds? And, and where does creativity sit? Well, think about it. Creativity is actually at the heart of initiative, enterprise, entrepreneurship, spotting and developing opportunities, creating new knowledge, the same creative processes that you might apply to an artistic piece of work underpin problem solving when those problems are open. Not the one plus one kind of problem, but the real life problems. And we're finding it's vital from shop floor to boardroom in a rapidly changing workplace, especially when most companies are being formed and, uh, and grow from less than 20 um, colleagues to start with. Thank you, Francesca. And of course, we recognise in this framework the primacy of English maths and, and IT. Uh, we should, as professionals, I think, regard being literate and being numerate as basic human rights. Basic human rights, gateway to future employment and well-being. The world is online and if we do not support the young people with their digital literacy and their literacy and numeracy, we are failing them. Thank you. And there's the magic. The seven Aspects of core strengths, 
turn into a pizza or a dartboard, call it what you will. And we've also developed a language of, of thinking which connects with young people and young people with SEND. Not these, which are, uh, which are the, if you like, a description of the framework for the Achieving Employability Framework, which is for the older children. Uh, Francesca, please. We have uh, turned the language into words and phrases that actually acknowledge the self of young people. Maths and me, the digital me, the finding out me, the creative me, other people and me, building the best me, and we couldn't make it any shorter, the reading, writing, speaking and listening me, because we wanted to celebrate all four of those, those four essential elements of communications. Thank you, Francesca. We just simply wish to use that framework in a way that is used in four simple steps. Make sure and aware when they are using these particular competencies. So you catch them doing it or you set up activities in order to catch them doing it. You give young people opportunities to practice and rehearse these core skills. Then you allow them to apply these, these uh, uh, learning opportunities with support. You give them opportunities to grow their skill, but then, as all good pedagogues do, we take the scaffolding away. We encourage independent use. Make aware, practice, apply with support, encourage independent use, four simple steps. And, and people who aren't teachers, many of the youth professionals we work with, understand this and can apply it. Also, which is wonderful, families understand it too. Families understand those simple four steps too. Thank you, Francesca. Okay, here's a couple of examples before I throw the conversation open uh, for, for discussion. Uh, here's a simple problem. Select a route for a walking bus so that all four friends get to school together. The schools in the, in the square and the four figures represent the children on the map. Wonderful opportunity to develop your other people and me skills. Get all four together, talking about the route, who feels most vulnerable, where's the safest route, where's the difficult crossings, how can you do it best? The creative me, well, there's about seven or eight different ways of doing it. You look at each one, you acknowledge each each version of, of, of what could be, but then you select the right one. And maths and me, of course, timings, distances, uh, and, and so on and so forth. A simple activity like this can get social and emotional learning reignited, but around core competencies. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is a particular favorite, social distancing ball games. Imagine marking out uh, using either ribbons or squares, a pitch with two goals. And a uh, simple rule, simple COVID-19 rule, only one young person is allowed in each square at once. There's more squares than people on the team, of course. And the example is to get the ball in the net. That's, that's the target. Um, now, you can invent rules. You can use hands, feet, or hands and feet. You can appoint referees and you can also appoint creative people to make up rules as you go along. <laughs> at least four passes before shooting. Everyone needs to be a ref. Everyone needs to be a timekeeper or scorekeeper at some point. Uh, I can imagine an entire day of activity hitting nearly every single one of the core strength competencies in the course of, of, of applying a, 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 a learning, if you like. Uh, learning activity of this, this group. Thank you. For this. Um, as with Tom, we have a range of freely downloadable um, uh, sheets and posters. Uh, again, please, uh, Francesca, if you wouldn't mind. Um, printable uh, stickers. Again, please, Francesca. And and uh, uh, record sheets, uh, records of, of, of progress so that it structures the thinking uh, with a co-worker and a young person perhaps and again please Francesca and uh, a certification and again please Francesca 
had a range of posters and icons that you can drop into worksheets, put on walls, uh, even use as a what's in it for me statements in learning outcomes and, and, and the such, all freely downloadable. And all of those posters are totally um, editable. So you can put your own targets in there, your school or, or Academy Trust logos. Um, it's, it's totally yours. It's yours to define and decide what is best for you and your learners. Next one, please, Stephanie. So just winding up now, We've presented three different overlapping models and that can be used individually or in part or not at all <laughs> um, to try and, and drive new social and emotional challenges. Next slide, please, Francesca. Um, we should be talking about what we call smart cell, all right? Smart social and emotional learning. Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time constraint social and emotional learning and we can use some of the targets as you can see around that smart self uh, topic uh, from from tom's framework uh, as some of those smart cell targets back to individuals or groups you will have your own you could perhaps use the core step framework to do so next slide please uh, francesco and this is key as well it's got to be a progressive cell step-by-step -step improvement articulated clearly. You can't just keep kids at one level. You've got to keep the challenge going. And I've picked four, again, statements from Tom's bank of resources that could just rack up, if you like, the challenge and the intensity of the cell experience. Thank you, Francesco. Finally, um, when you get the PowerPoint, um, if you look at the PowerPoint slides uh, online, they'll be in the form of a PDF. All of these links work. So literally you are a click away from downloading and using either the ProgressStar framework, the resource hub, the learning hub, and also the free core strength uh, materials. Um, I've also added there the COVID-19 leadership support package uh, achievement for all. We've produced a whole range of, uh, of programs that schools could wish to buy into if they wish, uh, which, are, which are addressing what we know are the leadership challenges you will face in today. So that's about it. Thank you, Francesca. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that little journey through uh, uh, our ways of, of presenting a new way of engaging a new way of, if you like, re-motivating. Um, and over to you, Matt, really, uh, to, to lead the discussion. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marius. Thank you, Tom. Um, so we've had a few questions come through both the Q&A box and through the, the chat, which we've tried to answer as much as we, as, as we can as we've gone, gone along. Um, there were a few that I just wanted to, to tease out um, and throw at you, Marius uh, and Tom. So I hope you don't mind being put on the spot. Um, uh, Tom, what, uh, we had a question from, from someone called Ben Preston asking what, what evidence there was of measurable impact of, of Skills Builder. Uh, you've, I know you've spoken about some of the schools you know have used it. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, a measurable impact might be any number of things. Are you happy just to, to answer that one? Of course, yeah, thank you. And thanks, Ben, for the question. Um, yes, it's, I, and I, I saw your um, reference there to the APPs. It was actually one of, sent a small chill down my spine because I remember going to those progress meetings and being told X amount of students weren't making progress against the APPs. When, of course, myself, the Senko and everyone involved working with that student knew that they were. Um, because they were coming to school or they weren't coming to school in tears or they were able to work with new talk partners. And so I think where the Skills Builder framework really comes in useful is being able to um, sort of chart and sort of really sort of identify and to measure the progress that they are making in urban areas, other subject areas, um, as well as other areas of, you know, sort of aspects of their life. Um, in terms of the impact, I think it's, yeah, it's seeing um, the direct correlation between, you know, the skills that they are developing and how that how that then sort of impacts on things like school engagement, on how it impacts on their um, um, you know, social skills, and ultimately potentially how it in, how it how it then also impacts on academic achievement. Um, the impacts that that we focus on tend to be around the skill development that young people are making, um, and we 
Um, each, each year we publish an impact report that shows um, students who are working against these frameworks and the skills that they're developing as opposed to students who are not using that framework and the skills are sort of um, perhaps, perhaps not given um, you know, as much of a sort of rigorous framework um, as ours does. Um, ultimately, of course, with, a, with more of a long-term view, we're looking at how, you know, sort of, you know, um, you know, to think about how these skills being developed then lead on to um, you know, sort of better outcomes, whether it be employment, whether it be independent living, perhaps whether it be um, you know, sort of to move on to the next stage of their development. But as I say, the impact reports, which are available on our website, um, you're able to go and see, they look at the impacts um, of developing these skills with an explicit framework and a rigorous framework and those steps in hand. Um, and, and again, to mention obviously the use um, you know, within the EHCP targets, again, that's a really popular use of our framework in schools and colleges as well. Um, it's sort of thinking about tangible um, sort of targets and next steps. Um, and of course the framework, because it's written in that, you know, sort of student friendly language, is a really great resource to share and for students and parents and teachers to sort of reflect on and to think about, you know, sort of really sort of tangible, meaningful next steps, as well as to highlight the strengths um, within each of those skills. So I hope that answers it. As I say, the impact reports that um, sort of come out each year, are all available on our website. So please do have a look. Thanks, Tom. That, and that's really helpful to be signposted towards the reports on your website. I'm conscious that there are, in, in discussions I have with schools and, and, and teachers, then codes that actually there, there, are, there are young people who um, we are sometimes looking for an alternative way of measuring their progress. And by progress, what we're talking about is their engagement. And as interesting, Cara has um, just popped up a question about how this pertains to the new DfE engagement model. And actually, that although the engagement model is aimed at, um, at learners who are working at pre-national curriculum levels, actually, I think those of us who are looking at it are thinking actually, to put for some of our learners who are working at a national curriculum level, thinking in terms of engagement and how we measure an increase in engagement, which will impact hopefully on their attainment, um, is actually a really useful way of, of thinking. So um, thanks, thanks to Tom. Um, Marek, I've got one for you from, um, from Liz Gray asking, has, has the STAR uh, framework, has that been observed by Ofsted to your knowledge? Um, what was the feedback on it? Um, and uh, do, you have, do you know of any schools that are currently using it? Uh, the, the answer is it's absolutely brand new. Uh, we literally hatched this um, over the summer in demand, if you like, from, from, from teachers saying they needed a framework. Uh, they needed a framework that could bind together the home, the school. Um, and we happened to be, deliver, uh, as I say, developing it and we were a bit concerned and we weren't going to launch it because, uh, as you know, the engagement model was going to have seven uh, arms to it. And it just all looked very cluttered and we thought, hmm, we, we didn't want to put something out that, that confused people. But when we realised, um, when we realised the engagement model had, had five key outcomes, we, we basically got it out of the hangar again and, uh, and we produced it. So uh, we are formally launching it actually this week. So, so the timing for this webinar has, has couldn't have been better in that sense. Well, and, and presumably as well, the, the star... It doesn't. It's not just for children who, um, for whom the engagement model is appropriate. It might be useful for, for as part of any general program that you've got, oh, of course. or indeed of course. You know, as a short-term uh, child-friendly intervention for, or at least way of showing progress. The children are coming back into school, and you're identify schools are identifying new challenges. Absolutely. And we tried to make it as visual and, uh, and as, as low literacy as possible, because as we, we all know, many of the young people with special educational needs have come from families where, where there is quite low levels of literacy. Uh, and, and, and it makes it extremely difficult sometimes to articulate uh, small step progress with them. By making things visual, by, by simplifying the language, we hope to engage with families um, in a far more sort of uh, interactive way. Yes. Yeah, and I think I think if we know that uh, when children are in crisis, that the, their their levels of language can can drop to what we know it, it could be, and having something presented visually in the classroom to support them as they come back into school, 
I think is it, it, it makes total sense to me. I know that was one of the questions that, that came mm. through it. And another question has just popped up about you can't give emotional progress a simple scale. And oh, wow, I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, emotional progress is one of those, um, a catch-all phrase which is used by many people, but when you break it down, it is extraordinarily difficult. It's one of the reasons why Achievement for All, we've concentrated in the last three years on producing a programme called Achieving Wellbeing. We kind of recognise wellbeing is at the heart of learning, and boy, COVID-19 has certainly focused the mind on that, well-being at the heart of learning. Um, some of you uh, will be familiar with some of the well-being scale tools that you can get, can get out there and, and some of those are, are quite useful difficult I know to use with some young people with special education on these difficulties but um, you often get uh, those outlier indicators which start to tell you if a child is enjoying what's happening like attendance like engagement like actually uh, be, being there and trying to get these young people to back uh, to re-engage back is one of the absolute aims of, uh, of the materials that Tom and I are presenting today. Something that's different, distinctive, it might be new and it just might be the thing that re-engages and reignites formal learning. Um, we had another question from, from Liz Stratton who was asking where the physical me fits in to the core, the core strength. Um, framework. Are you happy to pick that up as well, Marius? Uh, by physical need, uh, uh, what do you think Liz means by that? So I think I think what Liz was asking was whether or not um, it was where the development of child of a child's physical needs are within that within that uh, core strength framework. I was looking at. I wonder whether it came under building the best me, but maybe I, I misunderstood that. Well, um, the physical needs, if you like. Um, can be subsumed into the core strength framework. It's, 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 it's how you do it. I think the key for the core strength framework is that we're talking about mindful core strength. Yeah, and, and, and uh, if you like, um, when we are presenting this to young people, um, we've got uh, a little video which basically says that, uh, you know, uh, to get better and better at moving or sport or, 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 or your fitness, you practice and you rehearse and you get coached and your body can do tasks better and the link we make is it's exactly the same for the brain because the brain's part of the body and if you uh, use a language of learning if you like mindful core strength it goes together with physical core strength so uh, it answers the question it's about mindfulness and mindful core strength rather than body um, and so um, yeah, okay, acknowledge it. The framework perhaps doesn't, you know, doesn't meet exactly the needs of young people with physical needs. But uh, Tom's framework certainly does. And the STAR framework could be used to, to set those physical step-by-step, small-step improvements to motivate the young person. Yeah, so it could be used. So if, if, if a teacher's looking at thinking, actually, I want a physical development strand, they could use that in conjunction with, with another, with another programme. Absolutely. Um, I've got a question of my own. I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask questions of my own, but I'm going to do it anyway because <laughs> it's be controversial. I, I, I was just wondering, uh, Marius, of the core strength components, which do you think we should be focusing on right now? What is going to, what, which of those, of those components? Can you, can you start with one and then build up? Of course, up of course, of course. Uh, how does uh, uh, that yeah. look like? Uh, yeah. when you've got only a small amount of time in the classroom with with kids in a very uh, in a very odd and artificial way and you're you're balancing what which of those components might best be delivered remotely versus when they're in school you know, is it about is it aiming towards english and maths or how does the, how do we reconcile it with a broad and balanced curriculum um i've just Absolutely. thrown that at you uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay, uh, you, know, you come to one of the training events, it takes half a day. No, um, I, I think, I think, uh, and many people uh, I've, I've spoken to agree. It's other people in me, I think, which is going to be uh, the absolutely critical, um, I think, key step to re-engage young people. Other people in me. The, many young people have been marooned 
uh, in their families, in their social bubbles, which might be three or four brothers and sisters in an overcrowded house with a mum and a father who might not be able to support their learning. Uh, they almost need a reintegration into community life. There's also, and my, my, my heart bleeds for school leaders at the moment who have 150 page health and safety assessments to do. There is so much that the young people need to understand coming into a COVID uh, secure school environment. So a way of acknowledging all of that social learning that is necessary to reintegrate into a school community, you could use certainly the core strength framework in terms of uh, me and others to show the importance of A, following the, the, these instructions, but B, being part of the community. And, and, and in other words, reframing all this as a positive. If you can meet these requirements, you are doing brilliantly in yourself. Um, and, and also, I really do worry hugely about the, uh, the, the, the emotional well-being of many of these young people. Um, that's a whole new conversation, isn't it? Um, but but uh, much of their anxiety may well be buried. Um, and uh, anyone who's seen me talk before, my mantra, which is an anxious, frightened or angry mind will not learn however outstanding your teaching is. So it's meeting those lower tiers of the Maslow hierarchy. It goes back to that. And, yeah. and maybe the framework that Tom has and, 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 and the core strength can, if you like, build those secure blocks at those low levels again before you move forward. Great, thank you. Um, I, I can't see any other questions that have come through. Uh, we've got some comments coming on and still coming through the chat. Um, was there anything, uh, anything that Marriott, Marriott thought on that you wanted to add at all? There, there, there is a good point that's just come through about these frameworks being underpinned by good quality and skilled relational practice. Um, I, I, absolutely. Um, it, it, it's down to, as I said right at the start, the role of the key workers and the key workers re-establishing uh, th those relationships with the young people because it will simply nothing will work without that security of relationship i couldn't agree more couldn't agree more there is um there is a series of webinars that uh that, that whole schools end up putting out at the moment um focused on supporting children coming back with trauma and i listened to the first one uh last week last tuesday uh, it's one of three and I listened to the panellists talk about um, the need for there to be, uh, for, for, for pupils to feel um, secure and relationships of trust. And that if you didn't have those building blocks in place, then actually you're not going to get any learning. Um, and I think uh, that really resonated with me. And I, and I don't see I don't see that as being separate to the conversation we're having here. We're talking here about resources that can support engagement and that um, can help uh, teachers to teachers and school leaders to think about how they re-engage children in relationship building and and talking to one another and, and creating a re re uh, re rebuilding that social fabric and focusing on those elements that from which learning can then happen um, but I would recommend if the people are interested in that to to sign up to that there are two more um, there are two more events I'm hoping that Natalie and Francesca will be able to jump in and say oh yes that's the date here's, here's the link um, but it, it was really I would really recommend that if that is a particular interest particularly if you're working with children in care or who are opposed to care, which I think um, Liz says that she is. And on that point as well, Matt, um, and it sort of ties in nicely as well with the sort of previous point, I think one of the best examples I've seen of when the skill skills development or sort of, I um, you think about these core skills and essential skills has really, really been embedded in a, in a school is when the teachers really take it upon themselves to, 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 to know their own strengths and their own areas, areas for development. As um, you, um, you know, so previously, I've had I've sort of heard examples of schools where they sit down with the framework during a staff meeting, and teachers will look through the skills and assess themselves 
and then come back and share that with the students. And you know, I talked at the beginning about how this is not for a particular stage of life. This life, you know, this is lifelong learning. Um, and when teachers and support staff are coming in and they're talking about how they've used the skill of staying positive, which we which we all are at the moment, you know, whether it's you know the situation, whether it's the journey to work, whether it's your two-year-old running in during a live webinar, and um, we're all using these skills in different ways. And I think it's it's so so key to talk about you know building those relationships. This is not something that you know we're learning at a certain age and then we have to relearn something else. This is something that we're all doing and we're all developing. Um, as, as you say, you know, sort of building that trust and building those relationships, that sense, you know, mm. together, we're all developing these skills together, and we're all using these skills together, and I think that's that's really key. Uh, and, uh, I must echo that. Um, we, we have an emotion coaching program which we run uh, not only in schools but in youth offending teams around the country. Uh, and one of the keys of emotion coaching is not just what you do in terms of your relationship with. The young people it's the meta emotion philosophy element which is how you do you apply emotion coaching to yourself and to your family and to your colleagues and and basically a trauma-informed school is not just about what you do for the young people it's about everyone in that community and how the whole community moves forward in that trauma-informed way well okay I can see the people who um, who I just tried to duck out. Uh, I can't see any other any other questions. I can see that Francesca has put on the link to the the, the series on um, uh, supporting children returning to school with trauma, uh, and also the link to the survey. Um, if I can ask you, uh, if you're still here, to just to, to fill that in while you're here, would be really grateful. It'd be great to get your feedback on today. Um, Otherwise, I think we will call it a we'll call it a day. Thank you, Marius. Thank you, Tom. We really appreciate you coming and sharing with us these resources. And just to just to reinforce, uh, really, just fin finish. These are all free to download, free to use, uh, following the links provided in the presentation. The presentation will be uh, emailed out to you uh, separately. And if you are wanting to signpost other other people towards this seminar you will also get a link uh, where you, which you can share, which will, um, where you'll be able to re-watch this if you so choose or, or, or share with somebody else. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much for, for coming. We hope to see you again at other uh, webinars such as this uh, by High School Send uh, and take care. Thank you.